what we're looking at right now, and, and one of the reasons I think that the intellectual dark web has particularly arisen at this time, is that we really did have the emergence of this new stage of development. And it really is radically uh, relativistic, radically egalitarian, puts a great deal of emphasis on equal outcome, and sees any differences at all as the product of oppression or discrimination. And that's what so many of the intellectual dark web people are fighting against. They're saying, look, it's, it's possible that some of that is oppression, no doubt. But there are also other reasons that we see these differences. And they might have to do with different interests in male and female, for example. Some people would say that that is, is a caricature and most people on the left don't believe those things. Well, then here's the question. Why is it that this moderate, reasonable left doesn't tell these shrill voices to shut up? They're terrified. So it's not like you, get, you sit down with someone and automatically you strengthen them. I, I, there's no automatic. Maybe they'll be strengthened if their ideas are good. Uh, and, and I, I don't think I'd ever argue that you shouldn't sit down with yeah. someone. I think my yeah. main point is whether people are being challenged enough. I mean... Cause, and I, that goes back to my point before about has, has it shifted? Because, because now there are expectations. I mean, we're seeing this with Joe Rogan. I mm -hmm. think we're seeing this with you as well, that yeah. there are expectations that you will hold people to account in a way that when you were an upstart kind of alternative media channel, well, yeah, so, we're not there. Right. So... As I said earlier, the, look, the bigger you get, the more relevant you get, the more haters are going to come out, but the more that legitimate criticism will come out, too. And again, I address this all the time. What I mean, do you think is the most legitimate criticism? It's not really for me to say what the legitimate criticism of me. If someone wants to say that they don't like the way I interview or that I don't ask hard enough questions or something like that, well, I suppose that is a legitimate criticism of me. It's not the way I like doing my business. The nature of the media has changed so much that once you're looking at a particular kind of information source or a certain kind of world, you just get more and more feedback that supports that view, and there's more and more reason to distrust everybody else. So we're all learning how to distrust everybody else and to conform to our particular worldview, and that erodes the sense that there's some larger consensus reality that's weaving us together. So we're kind of let loose in this very fragmented, it's like people used to complain about postmodernism in the 80s and early 90s. It's like, you know, now, we're, now we're living in it. Now we're living real relativism. One of the ideas that led me to his book, Maps of Meaning, early on, was just from reading different philosophers, I, I sort of came to this conclusion that you can have two people in the same room, you know, in the same place with the same coffee table in front of them, but your belief system and the way you frame the world informs reality to the extent where we can literally be in two different realities, even if we're beside each other. And this was like a big aha moment for me of, well, we're kind of screwed. Like, how can people really understand each other and, and resolve conflicts? And I remember that being the initial thing that somehow led me, I think, through some, a Google search to maps of meaning. So it's interesting how I, you know, later found myself working on this film about uh, Jordan's comments on Bill C-16 evolving into all of this other, uh, these other issues of political correctness, but with, with this idea of culture war um, looming underneath all of that. I've always been interested in stuff to do with psychology of almost every kind. And I'm also interested in spiritual stuff in a very weakened form, um, which is what I, what I call um, why we're here. Is there a purpose of life? And of course, the current scientific uh, paradigm says there's no purpose at all. Uh, consciousness is an epiphenomenon caused by chemical, <laughs> sorry, chemical reaction, which I think is complete nonsense. It reminds me of what George Orwell once said, which was only an intellectual could believe that. 
There are two types of hierarchies. And this is what Green absolutely overlooks, and it's a disaster. There are dominator hierarchies, and there are growth hierarchies, or actualization hierarchies. Dominator hierarchies are all the horrible things that postmodernists say they are. They're tyrannical, they're power structured, they're uh, oppressive, they're the cause of almost every nightmare you can think of in human history. And you want to do as much as you can to get rid of those as much as you possibly can. But then there are growth hierarchies. Those are the opposite of, do literally the opposite of dominator hierarchies. In a dominate, are those the same thing as what Peterson would describe as hierarchies of competence? Close to it. The dominator hierarchies, the higher you go in a dominator hierarchy, the more people you can oppress, the more people you can hurt, the more exclusive you are. The higher you go in a growth hierarchy, the more inclusive you are. You actually are including more people. We saw that simple developmental model that goes from just me to a group, to all groups, to all humans, to integrating all of those. That's a growth hierarchy. You know, I started being like, okay, I can't, I can't trust news to be true because news is narrative warfare. I can't trust science without actually really looking at what was the methodology employed? How was it funded? What were the axioms that the team was using? What were the logical transforms? Am I seeing all of their data or the cherry pick data? And as, we, as I started to kind of unfold to say, where are the high signal, low noise sources that I can offload some of the cognitive complexity of making sense of the world to? The answer is really sad, right? I don't know any sources that are very high signal and low noise ac across lots of areas. So then I started being like, well, why is that? And what would it take to fix that? What would it take to make a world that had an intact information ecology? Well, that requires understanding why the current information ecology is as broken as it is. And we're starting to touch on a couple things here, but this goes deep. And how do we make good choices if we don't have good sense making? Well, obviously we can't. But due to increasing technological capacity, right? Increasing population multiplied by increasing impact per person we're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind, right? And so I think many of the people that you've had on Rebel Wisdom have been in a deep inquiry around how do we actually fix our own sense making. And it's some of what has brought us to have conversations with each other because a part of how we work with our own sense making is we recognize the cognitive complexity of issues that the world faces is more than a single person can process, a single brain that can't actually hold that cognitive complexity. I hate both phrases, toxic masculinity and toxic femininity. And you know, the piece that I wrote for Quillette I think it was called on toxic femininity to to make the point right up front, um, you know, before I got into it in the piece that this that this was going to be that conversation, or at least a very small part of it. Actually, there's there's a lot lot more to say about it, um, which is that men can go violent, few of them do, but it's bad. Women are much less likely to go physically violent. We're on average smaller and not as strong. Of course, we're not as likely to have used physical violence as our weapon, right? Men are more likely to have used physical violence as their weapon when they went violent. Women are much more likely to use wiles and sexuality because especially for young women, that is where their power is. And young women have such vast power over basically every other demographic, at least in American culture, in, in some cultures in the, in the Far East where elders are respected more, this is not, this is not gonna be the, the same kind of dynamic. Part of me wants to work uh, quietly and part of me realizes that we have to work in some public facing capacity. And I personally have found it much more comfortable to have a private life um, to not have uh, everything that I'm thinking 
um, broadcast uh, to a large audience. But I think we've run out of time. And so um, I think some of us are somewhat reluctantly uh, choosing to make a, a different call now. I think that with the current administration and the White House, you're seeing a, a real discontinuity with the past. And it wasn't the discontinuity that I was hoping for. Uh, we had to break with the past. And I think that the way in which we are now breaking with the past is so destructive. Um, nobody knows what to believe. Nobody quite knows what's true. Nobody knows where to turn. Um, this is not a tenable situation. And so either we're going to descend into some kind of permanent chaos or there's going to be, have to be something that we reboot from. And that thing cannot be simply left or simply right. And that's one of the reasons that the IDW is hopeful to me. Well done for making it to the end. Just wanted to let you know a few things we've got coming up, including the biggest event we've ever done, the Rebel Wisdom Festival, which will be a mix of ideas and dialogues between people like Douglas Rushkoff, Daniel Schmachtenberger, Benita Roy, Rupert Sheldrake, John Vivekey, and many more. And because wisdom isn't just intellectual, it's also about practice, we'll be offering experiences like circling, different interpersonal dialogue, mindfulness, breath work, and many other with world-class facilitators. And if you're enjoying the content, you can help us make more by joining the Rebel Wisdom Club, which will give you discounts on the courses and the events, and also access to a load more content on the website, including all of our live events. It'll also give you access to our growing community, which is something we want to make a real focus for 2020 adding more meetups and other services for members. So, hope you enjoyed the film and see you soon.